Well, we are officially at spring here on the homestead, and it's kind of funny because it doesn't feel like a whole lot is happening yet, but by next month, we will be in full on production mode. So I'm trying to get through and getting a few things done that I didn't quite get done yet. So here I have my elderberry. I've already got my blueberries and raspberries pruned for the year, but I hadn't gotten to the elderberry except for taking the cuttings. And I was going to prune that same day, but the weather turned really nasty after that and I didn't get to it. And of course, it is now starting to sprinkle again. There's something about turning on the camera that makes it rain here in the Pacific Northwest. So if you wanna learn how to do cuttings from elderberries, you can check out that video. We'll make sure and we link to it below for you. But we are actually going to be pruning our elderberries. So when do you wanna prune your elderberries? You wanna do it when the tree is still in dormancy. So for most people, that's going to be the end of winter and or the first part of spring. So we don't really have a ton of bud break yet. We've got a few little buds here, but they're still pretty close. They're not opening up. So we are still in our dormancy phase. And I've already went through and taken what I wanted of our cuttings. So when you're pruning an elderberry plant, it's a little bit different pruning an elderberry tree than it is pruning an actual fruit tree. So each berry and tree, a lot of them have slightly different pruning techniques. So you wanna make sure you're doing it to the specific plant and not applying how you would prune an elderberry to a blueberry bush or an apple tree as example. So we are going to come, and I'm actually, you can see elderberry can become very sprawling. It can spread out really quick. So I've, this is the main plant that we first planted here. And this is a, going on five years old. I had to count. This is almost a five, this is its fifth year. So this is the main tree. And then it has sent out these runners. This is an elderberry and this is an elderberry offshoot as well as these ones, which are a little bit larger. Those are from this year. These are from two years ago. Because I want to propagate more elderberry down at our other farm, I'm going to be digging these up and I'll just sever them from the main root. They've got their own root systems here. So I'm gonna dig these up and remove them. But I don't want the rest of this plant to continue to become really big and sprawling because I don't wanna have to put a ladder in order to pick. And by pruning this back hard, like we're gonna do right now, will actually give me more berry production and growth while keeping the elderberry tree at a more manageable size. So unlike fruit tree pruning, or even berry bush pruning, we are going to take this to about eight inches to a foot above ground level. So we're not even gonna be looking at the different buds up here, we're just gonna be taking this down. And this will actually create a ton of new growth for this year. Timber. Now to keep an elderberry tree from spreading, you can simply mow around it and keep all of the little offshoots from coming up. You would just mow around it throughout the year. Another management tool is if it's really gotten super bad out of control and it's spreading way too much for you, is what you can call a really hard prune. And that would be where you would take the outer pieces like this and you would cut them all the way to the ground. And then as they started to try to come back up, you would continue just mowing them down and you would just leave a few center branches here to become the new tree. So you would prune, say three of these to this height and these would be the only ones that you would let keep growing you would prune everything else down to ground level and you would continually mow as, or cut back if you didn't have them over in there or by hand as those continued to shoot up. And then that would be keeping and maintaining that at just these in the center part and keeping the tree much smaller. So you kind of have a couple of options there. Now you don't want to do this type of hard pruning when it's a small in its first couple of years. This is a method that you'll use once it's an established tree, usually about the fourth and fifth year.
So these ones I'm not digging up quite yet because I cannot plant them until the end of this week. We are getting the power in at the farmstead, which is where I want to transfer these to. And there's a big ditch being dug. And until we can get the equipment in to fill it back, I don't want to put these in. So I'm going to leave these here and I'll get those dug up and transplanted at the end of this week. But we have a lot of other fun things that are starting to grow. So let's go check those out. So I have to be honest with you guys. We have so many projects going on right now getting ready for the conference for the farmstead we've had some unexpected septic issues down there that we're dealing with that there's part of me that feels overwhelmed and i was like well if i don't get all the seeds started i'm just gonna have to buy starts but then i had a little pep talk with myself which is why i'm sharing myself pep talk with you in case you need it because I know so often we feel there's so many things that we want to do and all of us at some point in time feel overwhelmed with everything. And while you can buy starts, especially if you do miss that window, because for example, with my tomatoes and my pepper starts, if I wait too long, then I can't direct sow them. Or even if I start them indoors a couple of weeks before it's time to plant them out, our growing season is so short that I just wouldn't get a harvest because they would just be big enough to start producing and then our frosts would come and would kill them all. So there is an actual window where I can start my tomato starts and peppers as well. And if I miss that, then I'm really out of luck for that year unless I go and buy those starts. And so I was a little bit late getting my tomato starts started. Um, and part of it was I actually was waiting on these new cell tray starts and part of it was really we just had so much other things so many other things going on that i normally had started them a little bit sooner so i was going through this internal battle with myself like well do i really need to get them all started maybe maybe i'll just buy them then i started to do the math and sometimes this is something we have to do because it can even happen when you are looking it's dinner time or you're you know you're tired and you're like well Maybe I'll just grab a frozen pizza. And there's nothing wrong with grabbing a frozen pizza every now and then or going out to eat every now and then. But sometimes we can kind of get in that habit where we fall into the what's easier instead of actually doing the math and keeping ourselves motivated. So I did the math. If I were to buy these tomato plants as organic grown, which is the only way I grow things, organic tomato plants, I would be looking at anywhere from four, five, maybe even six dollars, depending on where I got them and the size they were, if I were to buy these. And so by the time I did out the math, this whole tray here is tomato plants. Um, these four trays, if every plant in here was at four dollars, this would actually be over a thousand dollars that I would be putting out to buy these versus seed starting them myself. So when I started to do that math, I'm like, oh no, I can find the time today in order to get these seeds started. The other reason I was a little bit late as I shared is I was waiting to get these new seed cell starting trays. I, in the past, have used things like egg cartons, um, lettuce sh clamshell things, but we've been raising our own eggs now for so many years that those aren't things that I just have around the house anymore. And I rarely buy lettuce from the store because we're growing it, which I'm going to show you in a minute. When we started the lettuce seeds, those are already out and growing. I'm going to show you how those are coming along. But I was wanting to get some of the cell trays that would actually last beyond one or two seasons. And so a lot of them, they're the little flimsy plastic. They'll last one season, maybe two if you're really careful, but then it's something that you're always rebuying. And I don't really like, even though I'm recycling it, like I hate to just constantly be consuming and rebuying things. So these are amazing. This video is sponsored in part by the Epic Gardening. And these are their American made from recycled plastic. This is the six cell, and then these are the slightly bigger, which I will pot up the tomatoes and when they get a little bit bigger and peppers into these. So this is the four cell, this is the six cell, but you guys, these are incredible. These are going to last a lifetime. These are not something that's going to fall apart that I'm gonna to have to be replacing every few years. And the fun thing is, is because they are so sturdy, you're not really gonna be able to pinch, you know, like the really flimsy plastic, you just pinch them and it pops out. 
So they've got the hole here where when these are ready to transplant out or to pot up, you can just use the bottom here and just use your finger and you'll poke it up in this little um, cell of your roots and plant and dirt will pop up and then you can just put them into this if you're potting up or directly outside into the ground. So really excited for these. I, you know you're a gardener when you get giddy <laughs> about new <laughs> seed starting supplies and you feel like you finally found something that solves that problem. So really excited for these. And then this year I finally got to my larger heat mat. Now I've had some people ask me like, do I need a grow light? Do you need to have a heat mat? Here where I live and for most people, you are going to need a grow light. We simply don't get even in a sunny windowsill enough light without using a grow light. So a grow light is what is going to allow the plant to actually grow and flourish, whereas the heat mat can help with germination so your soil temperature based upon the plant needs to be a certain temperature in order to germinate but the heat mat is not really going to cause it to grow as much as your light and having fertile soil is the only time where heat obviously if it's in an unheated room you're going to need to keep them above freezing but with tomatoes specifically not so much the cool weather crops like i have up here broccoli and cabbage but with tomatoes and peppers, if the soil temperature falls beneath 55 degrees Fahrenheit for a prolonged period of time, then they kind of go into hibernation mode and you're just not going to get very much growth. So I am keeping the tomatoes and the peppers on the heat mat in order to keep that soil warmer. And so I don't have to run the heat in this building as much either, because as long as the soil is warm and it's not freezing air temperature wise, they are going to do just fine. So these guys, few more weeks and then they'll be big enough to pot out and then I'll actually begin hardening off the broccoli and cabbage starts that I have going here uh, within a couple of weeks because they can be planted outside much earlier than these warm weather crops. And if you're using cold frames, we've got lettuce going outside. Let's see them. So there's not a whole lot going on outside in the garden right now. In fact, the only thing that I have growing besides the garlic, which is underneath the straw, is some of the little itty bitty baby lettuce starts that are here in the cold frame. And they are pretty tiny still. I just got them transplanted out. They're only like three weeks old since I planted them. But here is the little itty baby lettuce. And it's so amazing, like I can feel this right now. This heats the soil up. We were really warm and sunny over the weekend. Today's our first day of rain. It's just amazing. I'm gonna close this in <laughs> really quickly because I don't wanna let all of that heat come out but it is amazing how much warmth and how much earlier you can get things in the ground when you are using different cold frames. This is one that I purchased from Greenhouse Megastore. We'll put a link to it. What's nice about this one is once it reaches a certain temperature, there's a little cylinder on this middle one and it expands and this will actually open up when it gets too hot to let some of the air out and then as night falls, it will just automatically, as the temperature falls, it'll constrict and close itself. So this is great because it's automatic and I don't have to remember to come out and open things up and close things down. I'm finding that anything that I can have that is streamlining things and not making me have to come out and do them is really the key to success at this season in our life. If you wanna learn how to grow a year's worth of food in person, I would love to have you come here to our homestead. We are gonna be doing a full day immersive hands-on learning workshop in May. I have a link below so you can check that out and I hope that I get to see you in person.